You are listening to the API The Docs podcast. We are here to talk about API documentation upstream and downstream. Technical writing shouldn't be under marketing, but it is in a way marketing. It's a way to sell the product by making it easy to use. That doesn't mean that I think I'm part of marketing, but I understand that there is part of what I do makes the product more accessible, makes the product more usable, makes the product more enjoyable. The only artifact you have in an API is the documentation. It is the product, because if you don't have that, you can't use it. You can't just throw random queries into the air and pray that they hit something. <laughs> you need something to start with, and you need something to expect when you get it back. We encourage bravery, I guess is the word. Sometimes it's like, you know, should I ask this question? Yes, you absolutely should ask this question. That's what you're here for. You serve to a degree as a proxy for the user. And if it don't make sense to you, it's not going to make sense to them. Hello and welcome to the API Dedox podcast. Your hosts today are myself, Anette Pozsár, and my colleague, Laura Vas. In our daytime jobs, we research and build developer portals at Pronovix. Hi, Laura. Hey, Anette. And hi, Tony. Welcome. Thank you. For our audience, Tony is one of the warm embracing friends of API the Docs, supporting the conference from the beginning. Actually, you gave two talks, one in 2017 and one in 2018. Correct. And now we're picking up the story again. And you're coming from MongoDB as a tech writer. For those who don't know, what is MongoDB? <laughs> so <laughs> could you introduce the context a little bit? Yeah, no problem. MongoDB provides one of the most popular, well, what was classified as NoSQL databases in probably in the world at this point. It provides primarily both on-premise and web provisioned databases to be able to do all your general type of work that involves databases. Mm -hmm. And you are a technical writer there. Um, more specifically, which aspect are you supervising? You're a senior technical writer? Correct. Uh, I'm currently working on the team that does uh, the cloud-based tools. So whether that's um, um, Ops Manager, which is the on-premise tool used to manage MongoDB instances, or Cloud Manager, which is a cloud-based tool to manage on-premise instances, or MongoDB Atlas, which is now over half of our business, which is a complete database as a service offering. I work on all of that and sometimes uh, other tools like uh, MongoDB charts or things of that nature, which are uh, things that, that work off of the cloud platforms. Mm -hmm. You as a technical writer have immense experience. I understood that you are calling yourself a technical writer for 16 years. Yes. 16 years ago, I don't think there was such a thing as majoring in technical writing. How did you become a technical writer? Was there? Uh, uh, in, well, not, not uh, maybe at uh, a couple of universities like University of Washington, they call it like a uh, human centered design and engineering, but it wasn't uh, technical communication as a field. It's fairly new. I came into technical writing primarily because a lot of the jobs I did previously, I was the person who wrote up all the explanations for things. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, here's the process to do something. Okay, I'll write up how to do it. Uh, and then I did a lot of support and administration work, so that involved a lot of documentation. And it came to the point where I realized, oh, there's actually a career to do this type of thing. There actually is a job to this thing. I started seeing job postings for that type of stuff. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll give it a try. Uh, and then that's where I started doing that at EMC back in 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where I started with, with that as an explicit job. And they kind of just built from there. And when I found out that there actually was a degree program in it, EMC, bless them, uh, supported my graduate work. So I finished a degree in technical communication and information design in 2013 with their help. Mm -hmm. What aspects do you love about technical writing most lately? The, the biggest one, the number one, is that it's a job where you have a definitive outcome in a short period of time. So, for example, if you're a developer, you may spend three weeks working on something that's a ton of back-end stuff. No one will ever see it. And then the front end, it's a checkbox. And you're just like, oh, was that all I did? As opposed to when if I do something, I might have multiple changes in a series of docs or a bunch of new pages created. 
And I get to point to that. And at the end of the day, it's like, I've done something today. I have not just spent my time in meetings. I've not just talked about doing things. I've done something. That's a big growth for me. Other than that, it's it's high on learning and it's high on teaching, which are both things I like. I like to learn new things. So obviously, if you have to explain them to others, you spend a lot of time figuring them out yourself. So there's that mental growth that happens. And so a lot of people say they want that in a job. Be a technical writer. You're forced to learn new things all the time. And I like the teaching aspect of it. I like to explain things. Is there some kind of specific topic or technology that you are learning now? Right now, I'm spending a lot of, well, in this case, free time with Python, just because I'm trying to understand what I don't understand. And a lot with um, SED and AUK and GREP, because I'm doing that for my particular API-based project right now. I'm going to have to search a lot of code, and I'm not going to do it by hand. So it's like being able to extract information, transform information, and do it in small scripts. A lot more fun. I, I, I understand fully that I'm not an expert in it. I never proclaim to be a programmer and I will I'll probably go to the grave saying that, but I want to make sure that uh, I'm able to do simple things. Like in this case, I want to find if uh, a particular setting is, is present in a whole corpus of documentation, do a grep to find it all, do set to clean it up, do awk to clean it up even further and then go, oh, okay, I do have these things in these places that I need to pay attention to, which is exactly what I'm shooting for, is uh, to kind of bleed into future discussion here or foreshadow. I have, uh, when it comes to doing a lot of uh, open API specs information, it's advisable to provide as much technical limitation and specification as possible. So not just here's the description of the field, but here's the field, the field type, the regex pattern it accepts, it's minimum to maximum, things like that. So finding all that in the code, if it wasn't already there or wasn't obviously there, so that when you annotated it, it's it's in the final result, it's a big deal. It, you will save the people working on the API a ton of a ton of time. I have seen too many APIs where it's like, oh, it's a, you know, just the data type. Maybe not even if it's required, just that it's there. It's like, well, that's yeah, if you're trying to write code against this, you're not going to sit there and try to guess or try to experiment. Let's cut down the time that you spend on this as much as we can. The context in which you're doing this, um, just to be able to understand your answers later, because we're mm -hmm. we're going to ask more about mm -hmm. your juniors and your team. So mm -hmm. what is the size of the corporation where you're working? How, how many people are working in MongoDB? And then after that, the engineers and technical writers per engineers are like interesting yeah, I mean, uh, MongoDB is about 3,200 employees this time. Uh, I know that uh, technical writing is about 27 people. Engineering is about 700 people, give or take. That's including the technical writers. So if you do just engineering, let's assume, so I want to say that's a ratio of about 1 to 21, 1 to, 20, 1 to, 21, to 21, somewhere in that ballpark. You have a central team somehow of technical writers or you have smaller teams and each technical writer is embedded in a, in an engineering stream? No, luckily we're all our own team. Uh, so there's, of our team, we're, we specialize. So there's leads that handle specific parts of our documentation, one being the server proper. So just that many immediate tools that interact with it. Another team that handles the explanation of how to how to use our drivers. So how to use how to use Ruby to connect to MongoDB, how to use Python and Kotlin, you name it. Uh, another team that does uh, do what we what we call working on our Realm product, which is a serverless application setup or same framework, I should say. So they write the SDKs and they write uh, code examples and they explain how to implement these things. And then the last team, which is mine, uh, we all do all the click and all the cloud-based tools. So we do all the tools I've mentioned before. And so Ops Manager, Cloud Manager, Atlas. Then we do the CLI version of it, the uh, API version of it, the Kubernetes version of it, and all the tools that support that. Who do you have daily standups with? Right now with cloud. So basically, we there's eight of us right now, uh, soon to be nine. Um, we're the biggest of the teams because, like again, Atlas is half of our well, over half of our revenue. So what we do is can be the one that impacts the bottom line the most. So we make sure that we have enough people to support what we do. And a lot of what we do is um, 
as we get together say, okay, what are we putting together for the next week or so? The, the daily standups are obviously every day, but then once a week we say, here's what we're looking at over the course of the week. So considering this theme setup, let's talk about onboarding and training new technical writers, because kind of feels like there's another wave of need for technical writing. Uh, for example, Google created technical writing materials for scaling education, and I could list a lot of resources as well. Can you talk about this? Is there really a new wave of need for technical writing? Honestly, yes. There's. It seems like a lot of companies are making technical writing, if not a an immediate, we may be talking like employee 10 or employee 15 instead of employee 50. Now, they're realizing, especially a lot of shops that are looking to follow the open source model where they're like, we are providing a tool that you can use ahead of time and you can use without paying for anything. And then there's obviously a, a upsell for things you can do later. Those programs, those tools, they realize that if there's no way to understand what they're using, there's no money to be made. Technical writing is, it shouldn't be under marketing, but it is in a way marketing. It's, it's a way to sell the product by making it easy to use. That doesn't mean that I, I think I'm part of marketing, but I understand that there is part of what I do makes the product more accessible, makes the product more usable, makes the product more enjoyable. And that's what my job becomes is that you want to make sure that, uh, that people can get their hands on and use what you created as soon as possible. I'm seeing a lot of startups where they're like, Hey, we need a technical writer for this. And it's like everything from Kubernetes type startups to, uh, code library startups. And they're all like, we need this to be able to explain to our users what we do. Like so that I've always joked, for example, with, with APIs, even especially API-based companies, it's like, look, the only artifact you have in an API is the documentation. It is the product. Because if you don't have that, you can't use it. You can't just throw random queries into the air and pray that they'd hit something. <laughs> you need something to start with, and you need something to expect when you get it back. So, I mean, I, I want to say not just the large companies, I mean, Amazon, Google, uh, Microsoft, they're all hiring like mad, but you're seeing everything from like a 10 person shop looking to hire a technical writer because they want to have that quality experience for their users. That's also maybe we should start having differentiation between technical writer and technical writer, because a lot of these aspects isn't what is strictly technical writing, but yeah, relations, marketing and branding and, and a well, whole lot of empathy and cognitive empathy that isn't right. necessarily technical writing strictly yeah. anymore. That's that's kind of that's where you get more of your developer relations, where they get into use cases and more narrative example, your blogs and things like that, which are all yeah. important. But like I said, if you, if you're looking at the the early hire or the uh, growth phase of a company that has uh, with its cloud based tools or API-based tools or uh, something that requires libraries or something like that, you need something that people can refer to to get themselves up and running. You don't want to have your customer base rely on Stack Overflow. It's not, you know, that's... Not a good idea. <laughs> exactly. They're also not going to come back to you. Like, if you want your site to be your way of showing people what you're up to, good docs matter. You want to make sure they come to you first and they read the docs and they go, oh, I wonder about this other thing. And then boom, they, they're still worried. They're still in your ecosystem. They can still take a look at other things. And that builds more uh, stickiness, I guess. Um, and like I said, I, I know some people listening to this might be like, well, that just seems like awful. It's like, no, that's just the way this works because you don't build a company off of an open source project without knowing that there has to be something that pays for it besides multiple series of funding. You're going to well, need something that's much more saleable. Both ways, right? Like you don't want to integrate with something that will disappear in a year because it's also very costly either way I'm on both ends. Yes, that, that's kind of like the insurance policy with open source projects. You're right. It's a case of, well, if the company folds, at least the code's still there. You know, then somebody else might pick it up and modify it or fork it or whatever and create a version that will do what you need them to do. That's totally understandable. Like I, said, I could I have decided. said the other way around though. If it's a company yeah. that doesn't make money, then sooner or later they will fold and then there you are with your integration. 
Uh, yeah, well, exactly. You're not on the block. Agreed. It, 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 it's like I said, I've also said, you know, maybe a company gets too big or they just make a mistake and boom, you still have something and you still have something you can work with. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, it's kind of amazing to me just how much the technical writing market has picked up and the education for it's been important. Now, circling back to your initial question about the idea of onboarding and stuff like that, the problem that MongoDB, when I started, was all about trying to, to, to catch the unicorn, trying to find a person who had every possible uh, advantage, you know, great technical knowledge, fantastic writing skills, very personable, et cetera, et cetera. But again, technical writing is partly about learning. So to keep searching for, you know, these absolute rock stars, there's a limited pool of those people. And unless you feel like just totally opening up the bank and dumping money, which any company, any technical company, they'll spend money. It's going to be on developers over technical writers, rightfully so. Uh, but you need to then say, okay, look, if I'm, if I know that the person's not going to be a 10 in every place, you know, maybe a six or seven, you know, eight in some places, fine. How do I get them that last bit? And you make that by having a good onboarding process. You make, a technical writer needs to understand a great number of things that people don't expect. Uh, what I mean by that is that there's the obvious company level stuff, like your HR, your expenses, your, that stuff, there's that. Then there is the pieces about your particular department, your company process and procedure systems. Then you have your departmental meaning docs, your tool chains, your best practices, your processes, your style guides. Then you need to understand uh, how to work with the various products. So like you're doing a three tier thing there. And then the fourth tier is just getting to know people because you have to interact with so many people as a technical writer. I can't say, oh yeah, you can just sit there in a the corner and write and talk to no one. No, you have to understand not just that you have to talk to them, but who to talk to and where to find the information. And so you're, you're trying to capture all four or five of those pieces in, in the same time frame. And a lot of that way you, the way you have to do this, you have to kind of achieve a balance. And then what I mean by that is that you can't just sit there and say, let's take one week and teach them just product. They'll get bored. Okay. Cause most of that stuff's, you know, uh, self-consumed, uh, video content in a lot of cases, the occasional in person, but it's mainly that. If you did that an entire week or an entire two weeks, you're gonna burn them out. If you have it be jump in immediately to things that they can work on, well, they don't understand a lot of things. So you can't, they can't necessarily do that well either. Uh, they don't understand the practices yet, so on and so forth. So you kind of have to find a way to blend it all. So what we started doing is we said, okay, let's come out with a, let's say a six to eight week plan that walks them through what they need to learn. Mm -hmm. Again, process, people, uh, systems, tools, the whole chain. So like the initial week is just getting them speaking, their computer set up, getting their, all their uh, environments set up, make that easy. Then the next week you start introducing them to some of the products, uh, not in whole, like say we, we have a new hire uh, training that's online. We took it, cracked it into its chapters and said, do these chapters during this time frame because they will, we will tie them into uh, a ticket you're working on. We'll tie them into a process you're trying to learn, that type of thing, so that they're not seeing it from just one angle. So like, like our second week, for example, we usually have them do a demo with one of the program manager, one of the product managers or program managers on Atlas. So they, they understand that they learn the product, they meet one of their subject matter experts, they have a chance to do something that's in person and they can ask questions uh, all at the same time. So again, it's checking multiple boxes. Here's them into like a ticket or two to start. And we pick those ahead of time and we figure out like what they should be learning from them, whether it's how to use our tool chain or how to write something versus, you know, learning how to handle a larger subject or learn how to handle, create a new feature from end to end. And we slowly 
that's like we kind of quite kind of quickly bring them along because again, like I've heard some companies take six months and it's like, no, that's just not that's not gonna work for us because otherwise we will be we're constantly hiring. So if we are constantly having these six months each time, we would never ever get out of this cycle. And then again, the tickets get slowly more complex. The product training slowly tapers off. The uh, amount of interaction with other people increases. So they get sort of getting involved in what we call kickoff meetings, for example, whenever, whenever we have a new feature, we sit down with the engineers, they explain it to us so that we understand what tickets we need to create on our end, what things we need to change. They sit in on those things. They may even sit in at some point on an interview at some point, just chat on an interview, just again, get, be involved in every step of the game, getting up to the point where we give them a big feature. And I mean, something that some some companies may say, well, they shouldn't be doing this until like, you know, in, you know six, nine months in. We don't do that. We say, we're going to give it to you earlier, knowing full well you're not going to get it right. Okay. We're planning on it. And that's not to, that's not to disparage our, our coworkers, but to say that look, no one could get this right from the start. Okay, even our most experienced people couldn't. So we would rather have you work on something like that, where we're fully aware you may have problems, and then we're allocating time, if not outright, uh, at least mentally, going eh, this person's going to ask us a question or two. So better that than have them work on something where they don't know what they're doing, are afraid to ask for help, and then goof things up horribly that we have to go back and then a bunch of us have to hit the brakes and go help them out. It's better to say, no, nah, we know this is coming. Let's plan for it. And we kind of take it from there. Uh, now we supplement all of this with uh, a mentor who actually puts together this plan. The plan's templated. It's like we don't start from scratch and we also don't force people to do the exact same thing every time because again each team may do things differently and they may want to emphasize certain things at certain times that's fine we may dumb it down not dumb it down change scratch that we might um limit its scope for an intern because the interns are only here for like 12 weeks as opposed to or 10 to 12 weeks as opposed to the whole year so we want to make sure that maybe that we don't give them as complex of an onboarding process um and we supplement all of this with what I what I've been referring to as office hours. Like every Wednesday, uh, I sit down with the team, all the new the new folks, and let them ask me any question they want. Doesn't matter if it's you know tool related, process related, people related, uh, career path, grad school, um, where's the best restaurants around the office. Don't care. Just give them the total free reign to ask any question. And I said, if you give it to me in advance, I will write the answer out. If you don't, I'll do that. I'll do it live. Uh, and again, don't record it. No bosses. So they can just ask whatever they want, knowing that there's no judgment. Uh, I'm not here to make their lives difficult. I'm here to help. And that was a, a big part of it. Uh, and it's it's gotten, it's honestly, it's cut down our, our time to product, time to productivity probably like shaky productivity three weeks meaning that they're still a little unsure to pretty confident by six or seven to doing something pretty big by 10 i would like to say that sounds mythical it does it does it, but it is kind of the way it works because until we we set certain it's just because we plan mm -hmm. a lot <laughs> before the person even walks in the door and we we revise the plan with every subsequent hire. So an example would be to be a two people start in October of 2020, 2020, 2019, I forget which now, I apologize to them for not knowing. Um, but when they started, they had noticed that we didn't give them a lot of time to do the HR type things, the stuff that they're required to do from the start. So like we immediately were getting them into tickets within the first week or two. And also not giving them a whole lot of time to work on the new hire training, the product training. And like, oh, okay, so we revised the schedule. We we incorporated things from other sources and said, okay, let's pull this out a little bit. And the next people didn't have that complaint. Like, yeah, that's fine. We will okay. we'll have no problem with it. Like we, we know it's iterative. We're not gonna go back and say this is solid, but because that's just that's just a fallacy. The tricky part is to give yourself enough time to make that revision and stuff like that. It, it can get a little it can get a little stressful. We're like, oh boy, I better get this, uh, you know, I better get this handled before this next person gets hired. But 
that's not a it, it's a joy to the job to be honest I, it, this uh, the more people who get up to speed faster and a better quality the less work i have to do so can we say that uh, the key is uh, careful planning and iteration and maybe open communication because what you just described i can hear it also as a double edged sword because it can also be um, overwhelming regarding this short time period and the many context which is yeah it, well it, yeah it, it, that's a big part of it yes is the fact that there's so many different things you have to learn that you know you're not going to have it perfect every time mm-hmm. and that's part of the reason you have human elements in there like office hours like mentoring where people know they have other places to uh to see those things through we're about to release our first survey internally to the new hires to see what they've thought of it um and hopefully that'll they'll, they'll think it worked out well but yeah we're we're going to start getting our first hard feedback on it in the next couple of weeks do you see a recurring pattern in some sort of mindset adjustment during this onboarding period is there a specific mindset that you're intentionally going for oh fair enough um well we're trying to build confidence because a lot of technical writers have imposter syndrome really de- really deeply and to understand that yes you're competent yes we trust you yes we hired you for a reason and go you know go with your experience um we think that's a big thing is you're trying to build confidence we're trying to build uh not just confidence in themselves but confidence in the material that they know that they're not uh they're not trying to guess things through um and all of it is a lot of it is critical thinking as well like we really want them to not just take things at face value to really explore what they're working on and and kind of break it apart we want them to start asking we want to make sure that we we encourage inquisitiveness we encourage uh bravery i guess is the word you know just say you know sometimes it's like you know should i ask this question yes you absolutely should ask this question that's what you're here for you serve to a degree as a proxy for the user and if it don't make sense to you it's not going to make sense to them so we we want them to have that that confidence that bravery that uh that uh, mental what's the drive that that persistence that application where you're going i'm going to really take it to everything i get and not just say oh no big deal or just this is not a big deal it's like that they mentally invest themselves in everything they work on hmm. which is um it sounds like straightforwardly of course but um critical analysis and in imposter syndrome somehow go hand in hand i think so- I, well, absolutely and like listen that that's part of the reason like I said we we don't have it be uh a lot of the the job becomes reassurance uh and and making sure you're expressing uh kudos on a regular basis you know whether it's a small thing or a big thing it's like you're getting this right congratulations you know if you were wondering you know because again that's that's what we what I've been drilling in to my boss our fellow leads and our director is saying understand that we don't know what baggage our new hires are coming in with what we might think is automatic they may have been told in many jobs before this you can't do or that you that your viewpoint on this must go through these other checks and we're just like no figure it out they're like mm, but i've never been allowed to do that so we have to explicitly come out and say yes that's okay yes we expect you to do this rather than having their that assumption just float there and they said we're assuming they're going to work the way we think they would work and they're assuming they're going to they're going to work the way they've always worked and having that that cracked you cracking that is the big deal where they start going oh you 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 actually do mean i can i can explore this on my own i can get into it as opposed to waiting for a boss to tell me every possible detail so, yeah we we hired you because you demonstrated you could think uh a lot of our interview process is trust uh, a hint for anybody who tries to apply to mongo the thing we look for the most is that you ask questions during the interview 
Like if you're asking questions, you're in the right place because we know then that you're not going to just take anything at face value. Uh, I, I'd rather have you uh, ask me a bunch of questions that I can't even answer. I would love to be, I love being stumped in an interview. I'm like, huh, I hadn't thought of that, which then tells me you're exploring things in a way that is different than the rest of us, which means you bring mm -hmm. something to the table. That's what you need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all this reassurance is happening in regular feedback rounds or with the uh, one-on-ones with the mentor, or just on the fly when the team is working. Oh, I mean, in terms of feedback? Yeah, not the feedback, what you, you just described this. You are good enough. You can do this. And, and you... Well, a lot of it is um, just, you know, random things in Slack. Sometimes like we have a, a built in thing that uh, the company has that you can give people little, uh, little points for doing well, you know, and things like that. So a lot of that happens. Um, a lot of it is just remembering, hey, this person's probably wondering if they did a good job. I should tell them. Um, cause I've wondered that, I mean, it's like the worst job in the world to me is one where you only get feedback is if you screwed up, you know, cause then, then, then you're, all you're doing is, is looking over your shoulder metaphorically to say, did I goof this up? Did I screw this up? Rather than having the confidence to say, Hey, no, what I did over here was good. I keep doing that. I'm going to be okay. Yeah. That's exactly, that's exactly the attitude we want to, we want to, we want to have you do. Thank you. Lovely. I see you soon. <laughs> You'll see me again. Don't worry. I, I, I have ideas yet. I'm, uh, thank you. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. Thanks again to our guest, to Pronovix, for letting us work on this, and the entire API The Docs community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website apidocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API The Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.